Hello and welcome to RED's virtual cinematography series. I'm Nada Albright. I work with filmmakers for RED. Today we're going to talk to cinematographer Jeff cronin -Weth. He's a member of the prestigious American Society of Cinematographers. And today we're going to talk to him about Amazon's series Tales from the Loop. We're going to talk about episode one that was directed by Mark Romanek. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks for having me. So I read that Tales from the Loop is based on a series of uh, acclaimed art from a Swedish artist named Simon, is it Stallenhag? How do you say his name? That's correct. Nope, you did it. That's great. He had a lot of signs I didn't recognize on there. So, um, so let me ask you that. So what did he paint? Just quickly, I'm just... Right. He created a kind of a unique dystopia world of kind of um, sci-fi, discarded sci-fi, integrated with what would seem to be something reminiscent of the 70s. So it's a weird juxtaposition of, of people going about their daily life uh, with this discarded technology, suggesting that there's something more going on, but we can't quite put our finger on it. And the thing that was like interesting about his work is it always put like, it always made a, a common kind of, uh, um, seen maybe a family parked off the side of the road uh, having a picnic with these discarded gigantic robotic creatures from the future uh, half half activated half discombobulated half apart and he did it with this really interesting color saturations and pastels and they're and they quite striking and stark but still somehow had this humanity which was the which was the really interesting thing about it yeah, no, it, you, it definitely comes out. Well, why don't you explain a little bit to us about this town where the loop is, what the loop is, just as, you know, quick, and, and the eclipse. So when we do look at these clips, we have a, a somewhat of a sense of what's going on in that town. Okay, well, this is a small town located in the Midwest. Um, our particular episode, the pilot, uh, has a time jump in it. So... We start off somewhere in the nondescript 60s to 70s, and then we jump forward a couple of decades uh, in the storyline. But the town is centered around a facility uh, that embellishes the loop, which is, for all intents and purposes, kind of a particle accelerator, if you will, with the, with the caveat that there's a, a foreign eclipse or giant orb uh, that's in the center of this of the loop, the particle accelerator, and it has effects on this town in non-describable and kind of irrational, unlogical ways. And so each episode uh, explores an individual uh, uh, resident of this town and their kind of experiences, uh, experience that has happened to them in somehow connected directly to the eclipse and or the loop. So when um, you start talking to Mark Romanek about this, I'm sure you weren't surprised. You've been working with him for over 25 years. Of course, this is what he's going to shoot, right? And he's going to direct. Yeah, it was really, it was an interesting call uh, before Christmas 2018. And uh, Mark reached out and said, um, you know, what, what am I up to? And and do I want to do, uh, do I want to make a jump into a television show? Because I hadn't actually done that yet. You know, I, I had certainly had offers and, and one of my uh, frequent uh, collaborators, David Fincher, had gone off and done House of Cards and Mindhunter. But those never were, like, the, the master plan for him was always that he wouldn't necessarily bring key players with him uh, so that we could do a feature in between the series and not, and not be kind of committed to the length of it since he was only probably going to direct the first two and perhaps the last one each season and then uh, uh, EP it the rest of the time. So those were never really options. And so when Mark called and had this really terrific script uh, written by Nathaniel Halperin, very genius writer who put together this incredibly complicated and sophisticated uh, uh, show and then um, uh, it just kind of you know it was perfect timing uh, the script really motivated me I could see uh, what Mark found so intriguing about it and what he would bring to it and so 
with my past history with him, um, you know, we I think we've always done really great work. It's always been a great collaboration. So uh, it just was the right per perfect project at the right time. Well, perfect. Well, we have uh, a couple of clips today. They're um, five min five minutes each, but they are I think they're important to see in their entirety because it just the clips alone tell so much of the story. This first one is with um, young Loretta, and it, it, you know you can say a little bit about what we're about to see. We'll, we're going to watch the clip with the sound and everything without Jeff saying anything, and then we'll play it again with you. But tell us a little bit what this clip is here. I believe it's the first. It, it's her introduction. Um, we, we start off establishing the 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 Loop headquarters, uh, uh, the com company and uh, she's on her way to school uh, passing all the uh, employees of the loop and then uh, uh, we jump into the classroom to discover her uh, and and then uh, follow her home yeah it's wonderful let's uh let's roll that This is bigger than your theories. It's about limits. Limits you ignored with your vagabond project. Alma, there's a right and a wrong way to pursue answers. You can't just steal a piece of the eclipse and think no one will notice. I've done nothing. And Loretta? What about her? She needs a mother. And instead, you're putting her in danger. She can take care of herself. The same can be said I don't want to listen to any more of this. Alma, I'm telling you. Put it back. Get out of my house. Get out of my house.
Som vi ska plocka En gång Vakna med glädje När solvindar lika och plocka När kärlekens ljus i grunden Till dig Love that. All right. Well, so now we get to watch it again, and I want you to tell us what in the world is going on, because there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. I mean, that's the interesting thing about doing a pilot is there's a lot of exposition. You know, you kind of have to set up the rest of the series without actually losing the weight of your own particular episode, you know? So it's a it, it's a lot to put in a, in a, in a single show. Yeah, but... Uh... I think it works. Okay, here we go. Go ahead and roll it. Well, this is MSEP, which is the Loop Corporation, or where the Loop is located. And this is the uh, townspeople all going to work. And young Loretta is on her way to school. And we just wanted to establish the, the area, the temperature outside, the snow-covered fields, the kind of endless flat area that is this town to then get a sense of what it is when she actually goes on her search to try to find her mother and then her kind of isolation within this group and to make her a little more vulnerable. So we made camera movements to poignantly be engaged with, with the characters and kind of try to elicit as much emotion or at least experience what they are within each shot. And so uh, it was kind of like, it's not so different than what you would normally do, but it just was something that we tried to push a little stronger than normal and break some of our own personal barriers. And if it felt like something that we were too comfortable with, then we probably should try something else. And so this, you know, ironically, it was unbelievably cold when we started there. It was below 32 degrees Fahrenheit for the first two weeks of shooting. Yet, when we shot this, we had to bring in snow and then the lake itself was was kind of like marsh mush. And so that ice is all CG. They did a wonderful job. because Although it seems simple, it, it's really difficult to get to actually feel it and, 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 and feel like that it's not something manufactured. And then again, her, her lonely journey, but to kind of create a sense of what the town is, what the era is, some of the subtle tonalities and keeping the, the camera moving, which was a choice we made because in discussing how to approach the subject matter, we all kind of leaned towards a Scandinavian style of filmmaking, if you will, like Bergman was one of our references and so the interesting thing is that the, the camera moves are usually very deliberate and longer than what we're used to and the shots play out which we felt gave us an opportunity to really get into what the characters are feeling you know it's a, it's a really interesting thing to create a visual style that stayed grounded when reality was suspended you know to keep the drama without losing the humanity which so easily is done in a sci-fi because you get kind of uh, caught up in all the effects and, and, and visuals that you're seeing and that wasn't the story and so you had to have this foundation of, of, of what the human experience is and then add the science sci-fi to it later and so this is one of my favorite scenes in the whole piece because we played with focus we allowed it to be all about young Loretta's uh, kind of intimidation and and fear walking into an adult conversation and then and then being discovered this we played with speed a little um, just because it was so poetic and we wanted to just draw out that a little bit you know water water drops happen so quickly that if you really want to appreciate the the beauty of that moment then that gives us a little a screen time wise it gives you a breath to then get into this next sequence so this was um, late late afternoon and her just kind of discovering more attributes about her mother that makes her 
more intrigued because they, when you listen to the show, when you have, when you get the full dialogue, there's an odd relationship where her mother is obsessed with uh, her science and Loretta is seeking more attention and love back. And so each of these little cues gives you insight into her character and her longing for more of that relationship. The overall kind of visual approach was to use as much natural light or perceived natural light and keep it as grounded uh, as possible so that then the science fiction uh, props and storylines would have a have a would be juxtaposed against something that feels so comfortable and natural. You worked as a, uh, a red as a first AC and an operator for Sven Nyqvist for mm. seven features. I did. And so did he did he influence your work on this super cold Winnipeg shoot in the natural light? <laughs> I, I would be uh, uh, lying if I didn't tell you I thought of him often while we were doing this. Uh, this and when we did uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo because I was actually in his hometown of, of Stockholm. And, uh, you know, he, he's such an acclaimed cinematographer and a, and a, and a statesman um, for our craft. Uh, he did 122 films. He did 22 Bergman movies. And I was lucky enough to do seven or eight films with him. And, you know, he used to talk about himself as that he, uh, he does two people sitting next to a window with two teacups, but, and, and that uh, his lighting style, which kind of, I mean, he didn't invent soft light by any means, but he brought a Scandinavian style of soft light to the United States. And it was all based on the kind of long winters and light that was available in Sweden. And you kind of work around what you've, what you've got, what you've been given. And so <laughs> my first day on the set of Dragon Tattoo, I just was looking up going, okay, I get it. I understand now. And uh, I kind of like channeled him for all these, uh, for those two projects to kind of, uh, kind of um, nurture me through that kind of soft light. And, 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 and interestingly enough, like, and I believe even uh, Mark pointed it out in one of our, one of the interviews is uh, this, this project would have been daunting uh, a few years ago um, on film, but, but even more so in a digital format, only because whenever you're outside during the day with snow, you have such a, such a latitude issue with the bright white of the snow and then trying to expose people's faces, especially if they're as often as they are in trees or forests or something like that. And, um, you know, it, it was in the back of my mind, but it, it, it just was never even an issue. I mean, the latitude is so grand and, uh, and the ability to mitigate the contrast, uh, um, it, it just never was an obstacle for us. Now you shot with the Panavision DXL2 with the Red Monstro AK uh, sensor. Why? First and, and foremost, like I've shot a majority, actually I've shot all of my features uh, all of my digital features uh, on red cameras, you know, all the way from uh, uh, red ones through through the Monstro, and so that was my uh, my my go-to, something that I'm so comfortable with that I understand how it works, and I under I love the color science and the latitude, and it's just an excellent tool for me. Um, but this this show uh, wanted to. Uh, be shot in a wide format and and the reasoning behind that was uh, we wanted to kind of embellish the landscapes that that the town sat in and we wanted to make her smaller in this world because it is a story about a girl who loses her mother and she tries to find her and the so 70 mil was was uh, was something that we both uh, mark and i both committed to very early on in our talks and then the lack of depth of field and something that the larger sensor gives us. Uh, and when you, when we first, you know, when, it, when digital photography was first introduced and we started shooting on it, one of the dilemmas was we lost that storytelling tool, which is depth of field, which is so important for filmmakers because it allows us to tell you or the audience what we want you to pay attention to or where the focus should be. And so in this, in our show, 
uh, we wanted to embrace that and let her be the only thing sharp in this very scary, daunting world that she's all of a sudden find herself alone in. And so the large format and then the 70 mil, and then it's just a no-brainer. If you're going to use 70 mil, then you want to you know you want to go and get the, the Panavision's inventory because it's just the, the largest and and the most uh, diverse set of glass. And so um, we did that and went through our testing. And I found some Pana speeds that Dan Sasaki was kind of rehousing, and uh, it, it kind of it, it just checked all the boxes that we felt aesthetically matched this project. You know, they're 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 beautiful, they're fast, but they have imperfections and characteristics and nuances that that other glass doesn't have, and so we fell in love with them. Um, the problem being, of course, when we started shooting, I think there was only four of them. And or when we started doing tests, there was four. And then by the time we uh, shot, he had cannibalized uh, some old sets and got us about six, seven set, uh, lenses in total. And then we, we offset those with uh, Panavision 70 mil Primos to kind of second unit inserts, anything that we had to break off into other groups, then that, that's kind of how we dealt with that, so. That makes sense. Um... We have another clip, and so this is, uh, we get to meet the grown Loretta, and I'm just going to let the clip speak for itself. I think we have enough sense of what's going on now, so let's run that clip. Great. What now? Where do I go? Home. As time passes, you'll see so much. Things that you'd say were impossible. And yet, there they are. Loretta. discuss this tomorrow? Sure. Whenever you're ready.
Let's see. Did you find her? I did. Everything's okay now. Come here. I do something wrong? No. No, not at all. I found this on the way home. You collect these, right? Is it a good one? My mother. She she left me when I was your age. And I want you to know I'm here, okay? I'll always be here for you. Let's watch this again. Okay, so this is uh, to Loretta's coming to a conclusion and kind of finding out this is a repeatable journey and they've returned the piece of the eclipse that uh, young Loretta's mother actually took when she does put it back, it starts over again. And the older of herself was just simply trying to explain to her what life will be and not to be afraid it's going to work out. As you're watching this footage, I appreciate that at least 85% uh, of the scenes in this pilot have the two children or one of them. And being minors and the extreme exterior conditions that we were working in, it gave us very little time to to shoot at night and there was at least 10 sequences that took place at night so there became a dilemma of how to accomplish that within the time parameters uh, that miners have and during the scouting i became aware of the fact that the twilight dusk lasted 45 to an hour being that far north that time of the year and approached mark with the notion of blocking rehearsing and then trying to cover our sequences each evening within the twilight dusk time frame and making that our night and the reasons behind that of first and foremost was the chi the children's availability second um, i love the idea of having depth in the sky separating the trees and 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 coming up this kind of cobalt blue sky that just became that that place uh at night and the resources that we saved on not having to light night exteriors in the snow in the forest. And that technology didn't exist uh, a few years ago. And the DXL2 with the Monstro sensor, the high ISO, the resolution and latitude just afforded us um, a perfect amount of time to create what I think is an exquisite night exterior. Is this a practical? Nope, this is the set as well. Um, and uh, again, this is a slight uh, mislead in that he comes in and sees the silhouette of young Loretta first. And then um, once he turns the lights on, realizes it's his mother. And they kind of, you know, the conversations that young Loretta and older Loretta had were about what the children were feeling. And this is her opportunity to kind of make, make back and and, and give her children what she didn't get from her mother. Yeah. Did you get to work a lot with your key departments on this? Like everything in here? Absolutely, 100%. That's one of the, I mean, all projects you have to, of course, uh, but when something is, is, is on a tight schedule with, uh, with less funds than you might get on a feature, then, then everybody's like kind of attached at the hips and watch each other and help each other because it all integrates to to utilize the resources and give yourselves the best chances of uh, at success yeah because the sound is also just spectacular and then the visual effects and, and it's one of those things where uh, it, it's an interesting piece that's that that's for all intents and purposes looks like everything is practical but but to me that's that's always when the 
when visual effects are, you know, when you see a Star Wars as, as amazing and fantastic as it is, it's all kind of hyper real and, and not grounded in anything. Where a show like this is like, you, you don't notice most of the visual effects because it's just enhancing what already exists or adding nuances that we couldn't get or erasing a, a you know, a, a modern day sign from a scene. But, but there's an enormous amount, like the ice field when she was throwing uh, the rocks and skipping across the ice. Yeah, it's it's an incredible series. Um, I've enjoyed, you know, watching all of them, and um, I'm just so excited that you were able to come join us today, Jeff. Thank you so much for all of your insight on uh, Tales from the Loop. I'm so uh, thrilled that you invited me. Uh, I have been uh, from the first day I shot images with uh, with Red, I've, uh, I've had an amazing experience ever ever since. And it, in a way, it's like my career has paralleled each evolution of, uh, of new camera. Um, I mean, of course, the relationship with Fincher and our, our collaborative relationship with Red, we've kind of been um, introduced to new products uh, and in a way kind of guinea pigs as, as we went along, but it's always been such an amazing supportive collaboration. Well, we're grateful <laughs> that you're shooting with it, <laughs> and we're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Jeff. Bye.